Ani, thank you everyone for coming this morning. Uh, Bojo Bindigan, welcome here to Trent University. Uh, Ani Bojo, Jackson and Dijnikas, Maingin and Dodatum, Nagojuan Nan and Donjaba, Sindam Zaga and Gan and Da, Michisagi and Nishnabeg, Nini Zaga Nash. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jackson. I'm an assistant professor here at the Cheney Wenjack School of Indigenous Studies, and I have mixed Indigenous ancestry uh, from Aldeville First Nation. Uh, and it's really my honor today to be hosting and moderating this panel. So um, looking forward to the discussion this morning. So the first thing on our agenda is actually to introduce Lorenzo Wietung, who will provide a welcoming uh, to this place. Uh, so I'll welcome uh, Lorenzo up to the mic now. Honey, the way you've come here. Thanks for coming here this way. We are here today to enlighten each other and bring those knowledges out of our minds that we share, that we carry. We all have a knowledge that we are taking around to share with other people. So I thank you for bringing that here today. I want to be thankful to the Creator for being able to get up and prepare myself to come and stand here this morning because I know people who can. I want to be thankful for the safe travel that each and every one of you enjoyed on your way here this morning or, or last night. And you must be thankful once again, we must be thankful for the beautiful day that we've been handed today, that we can walk through our life on a day that is so beautiful to us. I want to be thankful for all the people that have helped organize this get together this weekend. And I look forward to seeing you around this place. This land that we're on now, right here, right now, is where the Nishnaba used to bring those people who were about to pass. And this is where they would reside because there was so much natural natural foods for them to gather. It wasn't difficult to live here because of the bounty of the river and the forest and the stream. I'd like you to welcome you to this, this territory where I have grown up, where I have acted my living out of this area as best I could because it is still bountiful if you know how to hunt things are still plentiful miigwech to the east where new life comes from where we must be reminded each morning of our origin Miigwech to the south, where this warm weather is coming from, where it resides during the winter. And we must also honor the West, where all those people 
are residing or have gone before us and are waiting there preparing a place for us. And then the north. I'm very grateful for the north where the medicines are. The great white bear resides and takes care of us from the north. But we must listen. We must listen to the bear when it tells us to use the medicines that we are given in the prescribed manner that they were given to us. Because if we don't, the bear can show its other side. And we just need to look at the opioid crisis in this country at this time. People who aren't listening to the bear. Time to do. Miigwatch, got get any. Miigwatch. 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 Wow. Thank you, Lorenzo. Um, as Lorenzo noted, we are privileged to have a panel today of dis distinguished speakers who will bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise in Indigenous health, policy, and community-led initiatives that will help us explore the intricate web of factors that influence the health and well-being of Indigenous communities. Within our local context, just this week, an article by the Peterborough Current highlighted the recent funding of a community health centre here in town. Uh, but unfortunately, it was about $5 million short of its target, and I hope these conversations will help further catalyst uh, funding healthcare services across this region. So um, if you've never been to an Indigenous event before, we usually have a bunch of introductions. So we do have some more introductions this morning as well after Lorenzo. Uh, and the next person that I'd like to introduce uh, is Provost Michael Kahn uh, from Trent University to say some words. Miigwech. Miigwech, Jackson, and Miigwech, Lorenzo. Ani, Sego, good morning, everyone. I see that spring has come early in February. And while that may be refreshing, it also obviously has concerns for what is happening to our, our world today. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Trent University and to Indigenous Insights. In doing so, I would like to acknowledge that Trent University is located on the traditional and treaty territory of the Mississauga Ashnabeg, specifically Treaty 20, which included over 1.9 million acres of land in return for annual payments of perpetuity. This annual event showcases Indigenous thought leaders who are making an impact locally and globally, challenging understandings of our history and hence shaping what our path would look like as we move forward. According to Trent's first academic guiding principle, Trent prepares graduates with the critical thinking, communication, discovery skills, and knowledge required for immediate and long-term success in life. And I stress success in life. According to our second guiding principle, Trent University has been a leader <clears throat> in indigenization, indigenous resurgence, and reconciliation. Trent will continue to reflect this priority in instructional, scholarly, and community initiatives. These two principles go hand in hand. We encourage our students to go beyond the, our, their own expectations, encouraging them to explore, exposing them to diverse and different ways of thinking. By discovering who they are and the world around them, our students are prepared to go on and address some of the world's most pressing issues. And of course, one of these global challenges is healthcare. Dr. Manuwitu Tabis, Sorry, I've mixed, <laughs> I go close. <laughs> Research into indigenous health, traditional medicines, and social determinants of health is timely and will impact how health is measured and health care delivered. My academic area is kinesiology, so I do have a passion for health exercise and nutrition. I'm looking forward to today's presentation and the following panel discussion. But like so many academics, I don't always preach practice what I preach. I know my colleagues would say, you keep that to yourself. We all know the saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. 
I have a different thing which goes along with the apple a day. A piece of cake a day is quite okay. <laughs> On behalf of Trent University, thank you, Russell, and our panel for being here today. Thank you all for joining us, and I look forward to the presentation. Miigwech. Um, our next speaker, unfortunately, cannot be here this morning, Dr. Thomas Pigott, who is the Medical Officer of Health. Uh, in lieu of his absence, we have a video that we'll play about his remarks now. Anen, Thomas Indijnikas. My name is Thomas Piggott. I am the Medical Officer of Health of Peterborough Public Health. And I'm so sorry I can't join you in person for this second forum session on Indigenous Determinants of Health. And I hope it's a wonderful day. Certainly the first session in the fall was incredible learning with amazing speakers. And I'm sure today will once again be the same. While I've uh, in my short career to date been afforded the opportunity to work in public health um, across Canada and different communities and uh, around the world, including with indigenous peoples in other countries such as Botswana, Ecuador, uh, and uh, Uganda. I am still very much early on my journey of learning um, and better understanding the context of the topic um, that we are discussing today, Indigenous determinants of health. The field of public health is one that, you know, unfortunately is rooted in significant colonial past. If you um, look into the global, not only in Canadian context, but global history, public health was in fact used to help to support the engine of colonization. And so I think work to learn, uh, but also to change, to decolonize public health is of critical importance. And I look forward to learnings, uh, especially around our context of the Indigenous determinants of health discussed today. In my career so far, I've had the opportunity of working um, previously in Labrador, in the Innu Nation and Nunatsiavut Inuit territory of Labrador. And I now work here in Michisagig Treaty 20 territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabe. In this capacity, I continue to learn and understand that determinants of Indigenous health clearly are diverse. Contexts, issues, histories, culture are tremendously diverse amongst Indigenous peoples. And that is a lens that I think really is important to interpreting and planning around health. I think that the roots of Indigenous determinants of health clearly are in the legacy and the impact, the negative impacts of colonization. One framework that is sometimes uh, presented by the National Collaborating Centre on Indigenous Health is um, one of a tree, showing at the roots of the tree, root determinants, colonial ideologies, colonial governance, but also Indigenous self-determination. As you move to the trunk of the tree, understanding changes, systems, cultural resurgence, community structures and supports, environmental stewardship. And at the stem, the leaves at the top of the tree, the impacts of what we see now and today, including impacts on health, impacts that often for Indigenous peoples are negative, continue to be negative on health. I am very aware of continued experiences, for example, of racism and systemic anti-Indigenous racism in the Canadian healthcare system. Not only because of high profile experiences such as that of Brian Sinclair in Winnipeg in the emergency department where he spent over 34 hours waiting for treatment and ultimately died. Not only because of impacts such as the story and experience of Joy Seshaquan, but because I know daily each and every day there are negative experiences 
of racism that continue. In fact, I, in my position, have heard many of these stories in encounters with healthcare and other parts of our system here in our own region. And so there is much to do to address deficits and challenges. One of the continued challenges in understanding Indigenous determinants of health is a continued lack of appropriate data to guide action. TRC call to action number 19 called upon the federal government in consultation with Aboriginal peoples to establish measurable goals to identify and close the gaps in health outcomes between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities and to publish annual progress reports and assess long-term trends, including a focus on specific indicators. And this work needs to continue, needs to strengthen and develop. We continue to not have enough data. But I think the other challenge is that we continue to approach this topic with a deficit lens. We focus on health challenges and not strengths and not resi resiliency, which I think is, is tremendously important. I had in a project working on um, determinants of health across Canada, the opportunity to work with Bonnie Freeman and a number of other Indigenous health scholars. And in one piece, Bonnie talked about cultural continuity as a critically important determinant of health and strength. And in fact, there is Western research evidence that cultural continuity programs improve health. They decrease health challenges such as suicide rates. And this was observed in you know, British Columbia as an example uh, in the late 90s. And so there is evidence to guide the intervention um, of you know, cultural programs, land-based programs, and you know, strength-based approaches to the topic of Indigenous health. And I think for, for me in public health, this is critical. We need to continue to understand, to learn, to improve, but we also need to embrace the strengths that Indigenous determines the health bring. And I don't want to spoil any of the book. If you haven't had the chance to read uh, Wabashig Rice's recent book, Moon Over the Turning, uh, Moon Over the Falling, uh, Fallen Leaves. But uh, tremendous book, really, uh, uh, really uh, captivating uh, fiction novel that talks about a uh, period um, and experience of uh, Anishinaabeg people after a um, uh, sort of end of the world apocalyptic situation and strength because of traditional knowledge land-based teachings and knowledge and strength in health and strength in survival. And I think that to me is something we need to continue to understand is not only how to improve Indigenous health from a determinant of health perspective, but also that there is tremendous knowledge and strength to be gained and a wisdom to be learned. And so I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak briefly and wish you the very best at this session today. I look forward to watching the recording. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Take care. We'll see you soon. Bon mapi. Big witch, Thomas, when you watch this recording. Um, the next person, last but not least, is David Newhouse, who will be speaking on behalf of the Indigenous Health Advisory Council uh, and the chair of that Liz Stone, who could also not be here this morning. David. Thank you, Thank you Jackson. Um, I bring you greetings this morning on behalf of the Indigenous uh, uh, People's Advisory Committee, Indigenous Health Advisory Committee of, of Trudeau World Public Health. Uh, I am the, the vice chair, and Liz Stone from Sir Sanford Fleming, or Fleming College, as they're now known, is the, the chair. And uh, we have been sponsoring a series of public forums on Indigenous health this year. Uh, we had one in the October on the housing. We have this one on Indigenous Determinants of Health, and we have one coming up in the uh, late April, early May on racism and Indigenous health as well. And I hope that you were able to attend uh, that. We decided we wanted to hold this one here because we're talking about Indigenous knowledge. And this conference is about Indigenous knowledge. And, and bringing our knowledge back to the table is a form of healing and is a form in which we improve our health. We've come to understand both in the West and, and both in Indigenous communities that health 
is not just the absence of disease, that health is a whole of, um, of existence phenomenon. That when we talk about health, we're talking about uh, our physical health, our mental health, our spiritual health, and our emotional health. And our teachings uh, help us to understand the interrelationship between all of these aspects of our existence. And we have a series of practices and a series of, 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 of ways in which we can begin to improve our health. For a long time, as Thomas has said, that our ideas about health, our ideas about healing have been not part of the conversation about health. I've had the opportunity uh, over the past 22 years to serve as the science officer for the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Indigenous and People's Health uh, Research uh, Committee. And I've seen firsthand researchers bring Indigenous uh, knowledge to the table and begin to explore in, uh, in ways that make sense to us, that help to increase our knowledge, the impact of our knowledge upon our health. And it's quite, it's quite interesting to see. At the beginning, uh, 22 years ago, uh, when we talked about Indigenous knowledge and they wanted to bring elders, uh, they didn't know how to do that. 20 years later, the conversation when they talked about elders is now which elders, which community, and if you're working in Cree communities, you need to have Cree elders at the table. You can't have Mohawk elders at the table as well. So there has been a, a quite a sea change in the way in which Indigenous health is now being researched and the way in which we're beginning to bring our knowledges to improve our overall health. We recognize that it's a very long-term effort and there's a great deal of work that needs to be done. And so in Peterborough, we're starting this, this conversation with these series of forums and uh, we're working towards the development of an Indigenous health strategy over the next couple of years or so, so that we can then begin to ensure that as Indigenous people, we live well again on this land. So thank you for coming and uh, thank you for listening. And I hope that you enjoy uh, what our speakers have to say. So thank you. Hey, Mitch David. Okay, now we can get into the, the meat and potatoes of the keynote. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Dale Manitowabi, who is an associate professor in the Human Science Division at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine at the Sudbury campus, uh, where he is also the inaugural Associated Medical Services Jason A. Hanna Chair in Indigenous Health and Indigenous Traditional Medicine. He has three fires in Anishinaabeg and a citizen of Wikwemekong, unceded territory on Manitoulin Island, and currently resides with his family in the Whitefish River First Nation. He is applied medical and Indigenous scholar with research interest in Anishinaabeg ethno history, Indigenous gambling, Indigenous social determinants of health, Indigenous healing, Indigenous state relations, and Anishinaabeg Biscaubiang, or returning to our original ways. He is currently a co-investigator of a Canadian Institutes of Health research project, examining Anishinaabeg healing approaches to addressing opioid addictions and recovery with a focus on PAX pr practice and addressing addictions. He is also active in community-based approaches to systems level change and Indigenous traditional healing policy and capacity, building in collaboration with Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee elders and healers here in Ontario. Most recently, in collaboration with the Associated Medical Services Incorporated, he has started a podcast called Indigenous Medicine Stories, featuring the lived experiences of traditional healers, elders, and Indigenous medical and allied health pr practitioners. So please give a warm welcome this morning to Dr. Dale Manitowabi, uh, all the way down from Sudbury. Very good. Thanks. Any bonjour. Can I? Ani bojo bamadze jik. So uh, bamadze jik. That's something that I'll return to in a moment here as I uh, begin my presentation here. So thank you everyone. It's miigwech, uh, uh, Jackson, uh, Lorenzo, Wakidian, uh, um, David, uh, Thomas, um, and to uh, Lorenzo, gakwechma, uh, and uh, and enwekna nini. So I spent some time in Rama, and the, the greeting there is in Meknaga, and the response is in Wexigwa. 
I come from the land of Nishin, and that's how we would respond to that. So uh, also Nishin. So um, I'm just going to uh, quickly um, talk about uh, where I come from first, because that's important, right? Uh, when we go to communities, the first question that I get asked, and we all get asked, well, first of all, the first question that I get asked is, do you know Edna? Which is a, a question that, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I've had many times. Um, and so, but usually the question that, that we, we get is like, who are your parents? You know, where do you come from? Abish, Abish, Abish or, 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 or where, where do you dwell? Where do you live? And so um, I am uh, the, in my mother's side of the family, it's uh, Odawa Potawatomi, who are the, um, who recognize an unceded um, sovereignty in Canada and did not surrender any land or did not um, uh, sign a treaty. And that uh, oral history is, is uh, strong within my family. On my father's side is um, Ojibwe and is part of the treaty experience. The treaty experience of the Roberts and Huron of 1850 and so that, that's where I come from, and, and that's um, how, how I situate myself. Uh, when it came time to register me as uh, a status Indian of Canada, I was registered under my mother's side of the family, so I'm technically as, as, as understood by the government, uh, part of the unceded um, experience, and, and that's uh, realized through the fact that I don't receive any treaty payments every year, so, so that's, that's how that goes. But uh, the treaty payments flow through my father's side, and as some of you will know, there's a, a big um, issue right now with the Roberts and Huron, Roberts and Superior uh, um, Treaty Annuities. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my presentation here. Um, but as I move along here a little bit more, so I talked about my, my uh, Nishnabe background or, or where I come from or, or, or how I relate. And so, you know, I'm born and raised in Wequemcong, um, and I also live in uh, Whitefish River. And the story there is that's where my, my, my wife is from. And so I, I live uh, within her territory. And so that's what brings me, brings me to, to where I, I situate myself. And, and I work in Sudbury, as was pointed out, but I just want to quickly talk about uh, genealogy. And when I talk about genealogy, what I refer to here is, aside from it as being a, a, a biological construct, there's also a cultural and indigenous construct of what that genealogy means. My first academic appointment was in the Department of Native Studies at the University of Sudbury. And there's been a long-standing um, informal relationship between the University of Sudbury and Trent University, uh, mainly by way of, of the sharing of, of, of the knowledge holders. Um, so, um, you know, I, I recognize my, my, uh, my genealogy coming from uh, Jim Dumont, um, Edna Manitwabi, Tom Alcos, and, and all of that group that were involved in, in that local movement that was happening in the north when they, we, they set up a cultural base in, in, in St. Charles, and they also brought in the knowledge into the university, and they were doing all of those things. I didn't realize how significant it was until we invited Tom Elkos to come speak at the, the university, <clears throat> and he actually uh, almost, well, he was coming to tears, because as he was coming to uh, Laurentian, he saw the word ani, and the word ani in itself signified the, the, um, the outcome of all of that work. And when he spoke to us, he said that back then we were just throwing seeds on the ground. We were throwing seeds on the ground and we were just hoping that something would, would sprout out. And so we were hoping to just to have, have Indigenous people or Anishinaabek um, and um, finish high school. That was the objective at that moment in time in the 70s. And also to bring back that, that cultural awareness of things. I'm going to talk more about that in, in a moment here. But I just want to honor that, that genealogy. And so that's where, where I come from. And that's what I've come to know that we need to say where, where, we, we, where we have our, our, our experiences from or, or who our teachers were just to honor them. And in my particular scenario situation, I wasn't directly, I didn't directly learn from, from those, 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 those individuals. Um, however, through their legacy, I became uh, an apprentice or, or uh, to be mentored uh, by that. And so I just want to acknowledge that. So that's where, that's where I come from. Um, and that's where I speak from. And, and I, I hold territory uh, as being uh, very important. And so that's, that's where, that's, that's home. And, and so the, the North is where my home is and, and, and I'm okay with that. And I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to, happy to hear um, the, the local dialect here that uh, Lorenzo uh, shared with us and brings me back a little bit of memories from from my time at uh, in, in Ramal Majikkening. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I have a lot to talk about with uh, less time, so you'll find that I might be speaking a little bit quicker because I want to get through some, some ideas. 
I see my role here as being a spark plug to start the fire or, or a match to strike the, the fire. Um, and so hopefully I, I will have that impact, much like those who, who did before, right? Uh, uh, they didn't understand what they were doing. Well, they knew what they wanted and now they can see what, what has happened. I'm talking about those uh, two decades ago or three decades ago and, and even further back. So we are now part of the, the next generation and I'm I'm in the middle part of that. So, you know, we have you, we have the elders who are still with us, those, those original ones who came to the universities to bring this knowledge into these places and spaces. I came in as a byproduct of that. As I'm getting older, I, I realize that it's the next generation's um, uh, um, role to do that. So, uh, so aside from that, I'll now talk about my academic context. And so there's a lot to, to say here initially. So as I mentioned, uh, my original appointment was in Indigenous Studies, what was back then it was called Native Studies. I then moved over to um, Indigenous social work, um, Indigenous relations and on the Laurentian proper campus. Um, and also then I moved over to anthropology. And then I moved over to the, the School of, of uh, Medicine, Northern Ontario School of Medicine, which is now a university. Um, all of those places are at, at the same location, but they're, they're just a little bit separate as they're run administratively. Uh, in my job, um, I am carrying on the legacy of, of how the medical school started, which is to respond to a social accountability mandate. And the social accountability mandate in Northern Ontario means to be accountable to the society in which you are delivering healthcare, which seems to be a logical thing. But as Thomas pointed out at the start here, that's not how we actually do things. And so we are faced with that struggle then. And one of the, the things that we do is we um, have arranged a, a placement for medical students to spend four weeks immersed in an indigenous community. And I had spent eight years teaching Indigenous studies, and then I, I moved over there to, to start um, uh, coordinating that learning experiences. That's what I call it, is coordinating it. And the before and after is, is striking. Um, I could never replicate the learning outcomes that happened in four weeks in a four-year lecture-based university program based on those learning outcomes that, that they come out with because they're, they're situated all over Northern Ontario from Fort Severn to, to a tick mixing, um, Fort William, which are you know close to urban centers and, and Fort William is the furthest North First Nation in Ontario. And so within that experience, I teach about the things I'm gonna talk about. And so this is the, the reason by which I begin that, um, uh, that introduction. And it's, it's not easy. So it, it may seem like, well, this is a success story. You know, we've been at it since 2005. Uh, you know, generated, uh, you know, many physicians after that, uh, you know, time. Uh, I'm on the ground, um, in the classroom, and within that force of uncomfort that one is faced with, especially that, that, that tension, there's a tension. And so those of you who have taught in the classroom know precisely what I'm talking about. There's a tension when we talk about these things, and it's difficult to talk about these things because there's just so much colonial baggage that surrounds these conversations and these dialogues. So we must be careful. And I've learned over my time, that's probably the one thing that I've learned quite well is to be careful with how we do these things. And one of the things I've, I've been told about is this, the concept of angobzen, like, you know, move yourself in a way that is cautious and aware that there's danger that could be ahead of you. And I'm going to return back to that in a moment here. So uh, I hold the Jason A. Hanna chair, which is the inaugural chair. And my responsibility is to convince medical students of the utility of Indigenous knowledge and of Indigenous healing in their future practice by way of just understanding it and hopefully encourage them to do some research in that way. So that's where I come from and that's the work that I do. And I'm going to talk about Anishinaabe Minoba Matsuin and I'm using the um, Ojibwe pronunciation here. And back home we would say Anishinaabe Minoadzuin, Anishinaabe Minoadzuin. So we would say it differently. Uh, but I, I honor, you know, the place that I'm at, and that's the standard operating procedure spelling. So I'm going to talk about determinants of Indigenous health in the 21st century. So I'm going to be kind of a, a little bit maybe all over the place, but I'm, I've structured this in a way to speak to a broad audience. And so I'm going to include some of the things that we like to hear in the academic setting at the graduate level, but also within the community level as well. So we'll just move on to the next slide here. So I just want to, as, as was pointed out here, um, in my introduction, I'm speaking from uh, a Anishinaabe-centered perspective, and I've included both spellings here. Um, I come from the community um, Odawa speakers, who we 
we drop our, our vowels. We, it's kind of like, um, you know, it's a quicker way of saying things. And so we, we don't speak the long way like the Ojibwe speak. Um, and so we, we, we condense things. And I'm not a fluent speaker, but so I, I understand a little bit. My parents are both uh, fluent speakers. But I, can't, I come from the generation where they thought that English would serve me better than Anishinaabemwin. And so they, they made sure that I could speak that as my first language. So that's a little bit about that story. So, you know, as I understand it, Anishinaabe uh, means good or original person. And so, um, you know, I'm speaking from the Ojibwe, Odawa, Potawatomi, Algonquin, you know, as, as we understand that, that word to be. And so this, this, uh, this talk is in three parts. The first part is, is, is by way of story. And, you know, story figures prominently. And in the work that we do, I was doing a, a poverty research project. Um, I spoke to a Mi'kmaq knowledge holder. I asked him six questions. He told me six stories. At the conclusion of the six stories, he said, do you understand what I mean? I said, I know precisely what you mean. He didn't break anything down. He was speaking by way of experience. And so that's what we do, right? And, and so that's how I will begin. So I'm going to make things uh, locally specific, as, as you know, uh, which is always good. I'm going to talk about my first trip here in 2003, and I'm going to talk to another trip that I took here in 2021. And so I'm going to also return to those stories. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the essence or, or, or the beginning of the story, and, and at the end, I'm going to come back to that story. So you, you, may, you may wonder why I just, I, I just come to that end. It's kind of like our... our, our, our the way of the we stole, told our, our stories, right? We would we would speak in the middle, and we would end not quite at the end, and it would be continued on at another time. So I, I will honor that, and I will do that, and so that's where that comes from. So the second part I'll talk about is indigenous uh, social determinants of health, or the determinants of health. Um, you know, that's not necessary to add social to that, but I, I kind of go back and forth. And I'll talk about Anishinaabe Minobomadzwin. And I see Anishinaabe Minobomadzwin as being a theoretical contribution to an Indigenous centered understanding of what social determinants of health means. And so some have written about that. You know, I've kind of articulated that in some of the work that I've done. And so I'll, I'll do so again here today. And uh, some of what I'm going to talk about here is, is part of a forthcoming chapter in the Global Determinants of, Indig uh, Global Determinants of Health book. Um, and I, I wrote a chapter on um, colonialism and Indigenous peoples in that. So we'll move to the next slide. So I, I was speaking to um, uh, a Southern Ontario Indigenous leader. Um, and when he said this to me, I never forgot it. Um, and I, I, so I, I honor, um, there's a teaching behind this, obviously, you, if you just read it, but I'll say it. Uh, but I just thought this is appropriate place to, to bring this, this, this quote into. So this leader told me, he said, our people, are, our people are under a lot of stress. It is stressful when you are surrounded by people who want to get rid of you. And he just kind of stopped there and there was a pause and I reflected and I knew exactly what he was talking about. So this elder, I, I don't think this leader, elder, um, I don't think he read Patrick Wolf's Settler Colonialism, but he basically understood what he was talking about and, and what he just uh, expressed there. And so what this elder is talking about here is this constant pressure that Indigenous peoples are under. And it's at a higher degree in these parts of the province and even Southern Ontario because there's a higher concentration of, of, of the settler non-Indigenous population surrounding Indigenous people. And so that pressure pushes against the individual, the, the body and the spirit of that individual. It happens at the physical level, the mental level, the spiritual level, and the emotional level. And so when this leader had said this to me, he didn't need to explain what he was meaning to me. I understood. And I understood because I've had that experience myself. So I, I didn't need to ask him why, but it was a kind of a mutual reflection on the current state of things. And so I just want to begin with that place there just so that we can kind of set the tone and I can show you what I mean by all of this as I move along here. So I'm going to return back to this. I'll go to the next slide here. Okay, so Indigenous peoples in the present here. So I use this in, in teaching. It's, it's a little bit, you know, maybe simplified, but I'd, I'd ask that you... Uh, um, keep in mind what I've shown here because I'm going to return back to it. So, you know, Indigenous peoples in the present, you know, we have um, experiences, um, as, as you know, we all know, um, and, and this is, you know, I don't need to say that to this group here, uh, but there's also a dominant Canadian worldview that we're confronted with. 
And, you know, I could have made that uh, image bigger, you know, but for the purposes of, uh, you know, illustration, uh, it, it is the size that it is. That line is a continuum that you see going between those two circles. And from the Indigenous standpoint, there's a necessary connection to the dominant Canadian worldview by way of colonization. We, we can't escape that. So we're, we're forced into that relationship. And from the, the dominant Canadian worldview, there's an option to ignore who we are. And however, there's always um, memories that, that, that crop up of, of we're still here, right? And we express that through the words and our experiences. And so I've, I've met people in this world who operate from an indigenous centered way of, of living and seeing the world. They're, they're still on the land. They still do all of those things that we, you know, I would imagine they would do. They're speakers of their language and they're, they're carriers of their tradition. And so they would be at that far, further end of that spectrum. And at the other end, and so that line re represents the indigenous experience. So I'm just uh, maybe making that clear. Um, and at the far end of that, uh, spectrum is the integrated or there's other words we can use you know they may have been forced into that situation by way of the 60s scoop the 70s scoop perhaps their parents saw a better future for them so they moved to Oshawa to work at the GM plant or something like that or Toronto and they were looking for a better future for for their next generation because they were thinking about the future at that point in time and a byproduct of that experience might mean that they become integrated into the Canadian dominant worldview I've also seen individuals who are in the middle of that who kind of can straddle back and forth. And I can't, I think that's probably where I situate myself. You know, uh, by day I'm at the university and by night I'm on the res, right? So I, I kind of go back and forth within that uh, uh, logic of, of experience. And that's the case for many of us. But I've also, I've seen that as a fluid connection. I've seen that moving from one end to the other and not necessarily static, right? I've seen individuals who were taken away when they were younger and they had a lifelong commitment to return back to where they came from in terms of where their spirit and where their fire is from. And I've seen this happen at the elder, elder stage of, of life. In the 70s, I've seen individuals do this and I've seen individuals at the younger age and as a, as a professor's teacher, I, I, I experience that all the time, that this is where our experiences are coming from. So we're coming from these ends of the, the, the spectrum. It's complex. It's organic, it's non-static. And so I just want to, to emphasize that. So I'm gonna move on here. And that's going to figure into what I'm going to talk about. So next slide. Okay, so this is, this is the good part. Um, so stories, right? And so um, one of the things that I, I try to tell, well, I do tell them, but I, I, try to, I try to facilitate an understanding that when you sit down with indigenous elders, they're probably gonna tell you a story. And you're going to ask them a question. Uh, we give them research questions to ask. Well, research learning questions. They need to learn about where they're going and what goes on there. And I, I tell them that, you know, you're probably going to be told a story. And the answer to that question is in the story itself. And you may not know what the meaning of that story is. And that's okay. It means that you're just not ready for that yet. But I'm just trying to ex explain the logic to you of, of what you're going to experience. And so they quite often come from, you know, a heavy science background and they never taken much humanities or social sciences and that sort of thing. Uh, very little I've taken indigenous studies. And so this is the purpose of why we teach what we teach. And so um, anyways, this is the reason for, for offering that for those of you who don't know. But for those of you who do know, you know, we hear stories all the time, right? And, and I, I, I enjoy hearing stories. Uh, they're, they're interesting. So I'm going to talk about the first time I came to this conference here. So Bakwa when here, the wisdom is uh, I you know I thought was appropriate, and so um, so Nietzsche Ba is uh, someone you know a friend who's no longer no longer with us to me um, was was a coworker and I was working in Rama Majikining at the time and this was about the time of 20, 2002 to two thousand and four, and and in that time we would um, we would sit with uh, and 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 work but in the process of working he would tell me stories he would tell me stories sometimes all day long. And I would just sit there and just just soak it all in. He had so much wisdom and, and knowledge. And he would tell me about the people that he learned from. And he would he told me that he would spend time, he would go visit Art Solomon, he would help him make maple syrup, and he would go there and he would exchange his labor as a payment for the teachings that he would he would um, be offered. And he would talk about um, others who he he learned from. Uh, Jim Dumont, Eddie Benton Benet, he went down, you know, to, to South Dakota to meet people. And he, his whole life was an educational journey in Indigenous knowledge. And so he would spend all of that time 
uh, you know, talking those stories. And in, in many ways, I was his um, I was his student. I was his coworker, but I was actually his student because I didn't possess the degree of knowledge that he held. And I greatly respected the degree of knowledge that he had, and, and I was there to listen to, to his stories. And as we were, we were involved in uh, uh, doing uh, cultural community work in the community, and when things would happen, he would say, you know, we need to go there. So Peter Ochis was in uh, Midland doing a, a ceremony at the Friendship Center there, and he said, you know, we need to go there. We need to go learn from Peter. And so we, we went there, and then we learned. And there was a conference happening here. And he said, you know, we need to go there. I said, I've never been there before. I don't know how to get to Peterborough. I've never been to Trent. He said, no, we need to go there. I said, okay. So we came here. And so I, I was here in 2003. And there's more to say to that story. So as I promised, I'm not going to tell you all of it at this moment in time, but I'll come back to it. So the second story that I have is uh, in 2021. And uh, my daughter was uh, a student here at, at Trent. And um, I was coming here to, to see her. But earlier on in that day, I was invited to to do a presentation in uh, Wequemcong, my, my home territory uh, community. And at the time they were doing the Robinson-Huron uh, treaty consultations with the community to explain the importance of, of what it all means because right now there's things going on, but this is back in 2021. And so at that time they asked me to do a talk and they said, well, can you talk about how things were at the time of the treaties? And I said, okay, well, you know, I could probably do that. I'm, you know, I know a little bit about that, um, I know enough about that to consume, uh, you know, time for a presentation. So I said, sure. And so um, that evening, I was struggling. I was struggling to the evening before I was struggling on what to talk about, because I, you know, I wanted to make something that was meaningful, because it, uh, it was an important opportunity. And I, I struggle, I, I hadn't, I usually don't struggle, because I, you know, pull something up and kind of recycle it and add a couple of new ideas there. And there we go. But this time around, I, I was struggling, and and something that came to me was the the legacy of the impact of the treaties. And I was thinking to myself, well, how would I begin to articulate that to the community? It's an academic way of thinking. So I said, you know, I'm going to talk about it the way that Nishnabek understand it. And the, the and and when the time came, you know, it was supposed to be outside, but there was call for uh, you know uh, unpredictable weather conditions. And so that's a little bit of the, the back, back story here. And so we went into the community uh, arena to do my presentation. And uh, the first thing that I said to the community was, I'm here because of the Wendigo. And it was just silence. And so everyone understood what I meant. And so I went about speaking about the legacy of treaties and how it's had an impact on us holistically. And that there are times in our life, and for some of us, that it could consume us and it could eat away at us and it can transform who we are into something who we are not. And it could um, create an, uh, a context for us to exercise that on other community members. And so anyways, that's that's part of the interesting part of the story. But the more interesting part of it was that I, I mentioned that, you know, um, we're, we're not supposed to talk about these things at certain times of the year. And so it's not quite yet that time of the year for me to talk about it. And as I was saying that, the, the rain started, and the rain started hard and fast, and the rain was hitting the roof of the, the community arena so hard that I was being drowned out, that I was, you couldn't hear what I was saying. So I just stopped, and the rain fell, the rain fell, the rain fell. It, it, it went for, you know, a good amount of time for it to be uncomfortable. And so the rain kind of subsumed, and I, uh, I, I, you know, continued my talk, and then, you know, I went on my day. And, and I traveled here um, that day, and I would be confronted with that rain all along the way. That, that one day, the, the rain was just falling. The trees were, uh, the branches were, were flying across the road, and the, the leaves were all over the place. It, it was a really rough time, and I, I, you know, I had to drive carefully. And so, and so, so that was my, my, uh, my first trip to Trent, but it was situated within a particular context. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment, as I promise here. So let's go to the next slide. So, okay, so, you know, uh, kind of like shifting up here to make this more academic here, but I'm going to come back to where I began. So that's the, the where I will end. So what are modern understandings of Indigenous people? So I'm going to talk about the indig Indigenous determinants of health here. You know, I won't uh, spend a whole lot of time talking about these academic details of things because I'm interested in hearing what others have to say and engaging with the, the ideas that are being presented here today. So these are things that we all understand. And again, this is coming from a, a future... Um, a future publication. What I found very interesting when I was doing this, this research 
is that, you know, situating things globally situ situates a different perspective, right? We're so used to what's going on in our backyard and, you know, our home communities and, and our region. And so it gave me a sense or a chance to get a sense of the global picture. So all across the world, um, the modern understandings of Indigenous peoples as they exist is that self-identification is at the individual level, at level and acceptance by the community. So by day, I'm, uh, you know, PhD by, by you know, community, I'm, I'm just Daryl, you know, and that's who I am. And, and that's nothing more, nothing less. And so that's how it is. And so I'm accepted by my community and I identify with my community and, and they know who, who I am because I, I grew up there and, and they've seen me all the time. And, and, but there's other contexts here that are a bit more complicated. I've already talked about that. There's also a historical continuity with the time before colonization and those societies as well. So Lorenzo talked about that, right? And we're recognizing that, that we recognize that continuity of the past. And in story, I don't have enough time to talk about my own experiences with that, but I do have those experiences and many of you do. We have strong links to land and territory and the natural resources. I've already said how I see my connection, you know. Um, is, is where I come from, and that's my home territory. That's my home community. I'm surrounded by water, and that's how I recognize that and the importance of fishing and all of those kinds of things there. We have distinct social, economic, political systems, and this is global, right? So we have distinct societies, economic systems. Perhaps it's challenged by capitalism, but we have an understanding of, of, of economic logic of livelihood and exchange and reciprocity. And we also have our own political systems, right? Some of, we struggle with some of those. Sometimes we recognize where we try to exercise what those look like, but we still know what those are. They're distinct. We have specific languages, culture, and beliefs, right? So we heard some of that today in terms of language of this, this region and culture and beliefs. And I've spoken a little bit about that. We're also generally uh, part of the non-dominant uh, group of society. So we are not part of the dominant group, and this is the case globally. And there's also a persistence in maintaining, reproducing these claims to the past and systems as, as peoples and communities. So all across the world, we are doing the same thing. We're trying to maintain, we're trying to reproduce, we're trying to continue that struggle. And that struggle, you know what it's like here, that's, that's part of the struggle that I experience as well. So I just wanted to, to bring us to the global picture and we'll move on to the next slide here. So here's a little bit of for those, you know, maybe something to add for, for Thomas and, and others is, you know, where did this come from? You know, the origins of the indigenous determinants of health. There's a parallel to all of this and what was happening at that time in, in Canada in, in the past. And, you know, we, we teach an introduction to indigenous studies that things happened after World War II with, uh, you know, the, the social movements and the, the, you know, the 50s, 60s going on to the 70s. And so at this time, there was a recognition that there's a bigger picture out there. And there was a recognition that indigenous peoples were actually part of society and they needed attention. So the Hawthorne report produced, you know, 91 recommendations to improve, you know, us and in terms of economics, political, educational side. So there's ideas of social determinants or determinants that, that, that are in there, that are embedded in there to, to situate what our challenges are at that time. There was also the 1974 Lalonde report that started to focus on health as being linked to lifestyle, environment, biology, uh, services, and all those things. And what was interesting and new about that report is that they inserted Indian in there, that we needed attention and that we needed to, to recognize that, you know, there's issues surrounding indigeneity and that word wasn't used, used at the time. In 2002, the public, um, uh, uh, public health um, of Canada um, issued their 12 uh, de determinants and they, they listed culture and culture is still listed there. And I'm gonna to return to that in a moment here, but if you read their definition of culture, you would recognize colonialism as, as what they're talking about, right? So in many ways, it's an unintended acknowledgement of colonialism, but nevertheless, it's there. In 2007, there was an international symposium that brought together global peoples, and they recognized that colonialism is central to determinants of health for indigenous peoples and the need to recognize self-determination and all of the things that we strive for. So that was the first time that at that level, we, we first had that um, uh, understanding. And many of you have probably read Lopi, Reading and Ween, um, you know, the, the different aspects of what this means from an indigenous perspective, you know, there's the proximal determinants, housing and, and you know, infrastructure essentially within the community. 
There's intermediate, which is the health systems, education systems, and all those sorts of things that you, you, uh, you know about in the community. There's also distal um, components of health. There's colonialism, and, and you, know, you can read more about it. I'm not here to, to go over all of the details, but just to bring forth some ideas. And so uh, the next slide here is, uh, so this is determinants of health in Canada. So the, the challenge that we have in, in um, you know, I contribute to the social population health uh, curriculum of, 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 of a medical school education is that, well, where do you put the Indigenous, right? And most places there is no Indigenous. And this is the closest that we get in, in, in some ways. And so we, we, we teach about the de determinants of health because it needs to be known. You know, so you recognize all of these elements here, income, social status, employment, education, childhood experiences. You know, now we talk about adverse childhood trauma, all sorts of things, physical environment, uh, social supports. And I, I see skills here. I didn't quite get that one right there. Coping skills, healthy behaviors, access to health services, biology and genetic en endowment, gender, culture, race, racism. So I would propose that all of what is packaged here will fit within those two circles within the dominant Canadian worldview, right? So that's what most are exposed to and not necessarily always the Indigenous experience on, on what that means. So next, uh, next slide here. So here is some global statistics. You know, I recognize that it's deficit-based, so just uh, bear with me here and I'll kind of speak to that in a moment. Uh, we have globally, and this isn't, I'm not focused on Canada, critical levels of diabetes. Those are of the age of over 35 have greater than 50% of type 2 diabetes in, in their communities. We have uh, 20 years less life expectancy. I would argue that that is increasing. I was recently in, in Wequemcong and we were having a, a meeting with elders and, and they had stated that it used to be the case that the young ones would bury the elders. Now it's reverse. The elders are burying the young ones because of the opioid um, epidemic that is, 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 is confronting us. We have disproportionate, disproportionate poverty, TB, lack of treatment. So this is, you know, you've, you've heard this story before. We have poor health, poor maternal health, poor nutrition, experience poverty. There's a need for self-determination globally for all Indigenous peoples. We know that through UNDRIP and, and the, the work at the UN level, United Nations level. There's a collective, we, we need to address collective rights to address Indigenous health. So, you know, I heard that at the start. So, you know, this is a global call, really a global call to action to, to really address that. It's important. It, it's, it's stated at the global level, right? So we can't, we can't um, state that, well, we're not too sure about that or aware of that, or we're not too sure if our budget can accommodate that. There's a requirement for health systems, indigenous specific health systems. And this is the work that I'm actively involved in right now. I'm working with elders and, and, and healers on trying to understand how we can have a, a, a more... Um, a more effective role in that delivery. And we recognize the importance of, of what that all means. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that here. So in, in Canada, you know, I'm, you know, statistically speaking, going to, you know, not be here anymore 20 years sooner than, than the rest of the population. And so this is what that says here, right? And so um, just, just situating things globally. And so we have our own ideas. And, and so there, on uh, next slide here. So, you know, there's, Lots of literature out there. I'm not here to do a comprehensive literature review, but I've just kind of cherry picked some things that, that, that I, I like to uh, think about. So we have a First Nations determinants of health as, as um, expressed in 2011 here. These, so these are our own ideas of what this all means as well, right? So loss of language, um, that is a, a priority in, in our communities. And that's a priority for myself. I consider that to be a determinant of my own health and, and well-being because I, I can't effectively speak Anishinaabemowin, and there's an actual healing effect that I've, I've experienced when I hear that. I, I know enough to follow along, and I was doing some consultations with the community, and our, our language remains in our community still strong in a lot of areas, and in our consultations, individuals spoke their original language, and it, there was something powerful about that, and, and, and that just speaks to, to that. Uh, there's a historical pro uh, process in loss of identity and, and family. And so, you know, it's hard to see that. So I'm just going to read it. So I'm, I'm at the, the, the yellow one. And so, you know, we, we have that at different levels, right? And, and I was doing, uh, I'm trying, I'll try not to talk to, I'll tell one more story, just a really quick one. So I was doing a consultation with uh, high school students in, in Wequemcong. And, and, and then um, they were, they came about that experience. They were upset. 
because I was talking about many of the things that I'm talking about and situating within mm -hmm. treaties and history. And they were upset because they felt that they have a right to have known what I had spoken to them. I was a guest lecturer, a guest speaker. But they, they said to me that, you know, why aren't we learning this? Why isn't we have a high school in our own community? Why are not we why are we not learning that? Right. So they were reflecting on that. Uh, there's also a loss of cultural practices and languages. I've already said that destruction of individual family and community support networks, elimination of attainment of healthy emotional um, em emotional and self-regulation and parenting skills, right? So we, we have these, if you work in the social services uh, sector, social work and all of that, uh, you know ex what I'm talking about. But if you just live and work in community or even I define community very broadly, not necessarily on reserve, it could be also off reserve as well. So that's important. So this would be packaged and put in that other circle that I showed at the beginning. Next slide. Okay, so, you know, well, we, what about, um, you know, more about that, right? So, you know, we, we have the capacity to contribute to our own knowledge, and there's a lot of good work happening out there. Uh, Thunderbird Partnership Foundation, as you, as you know, um, uh, you've read, you've seen, um, you've, you've heard, hopefully. Um, you know, they, they do a lot of important good work, right? There's the First Nations Mental Health Continuum Framework, and so you can look it up, and you can see that really neat complex circle where there's all of these things here, culture is right at, there's number one in, in that circle here. But I'm I wanna talk about, you know, how I understand what they're talking about in relation to Minobo Matsuman really quickly here. So at the center, and this is a, a recreation here, um, uh, you know, I've taken what, the work that they produce and I've modified it um, in, in my own way. So, you know, they, they respond to the fact that, you know, we, we all need a purpose. And this is, a, this is humanity, I, I suppose, um, globally. Uh, we, need, we need a purpose in life. You know, we, we need a, a way of being and doing for wholeness. And we had those ways. You know, when we went for our vision quest and all that sort of thing, we sought our purpose out and we would go and, and, and find that. We also need a hope, a hope in life. You know, we need a spiritual base. We need values. We need beliefs. We need identity. We need that in order to be healthy. We also need belonging. We need to be supported. We need to have that emotional connection. We need to have family, community relationships. And we need to have that attitude, that reciprocal attitude that happens when you feel safe within those circles and within that space. And we also, we need meaning. So this response to the mental component, we, we, need, we need to understand, we need to understand our existence and to seek meaning in our existence. And those are those primary components of what this means in terms of a, a mental health wellness framework, but it could be applied in, in, others, in other ways as well, aside from the, the mental aspect. And in between is the balance. Indigenous wellness behaviors is our balance. We, we, need, to, we need to seek that out as a way of a balance. And this is what, what is um, unique about the Indigenous approach to things as I come to understand it, which is different from, for instance, Christianity. Christianity, you know, you need to be good. You need to be good. You need to stay away from the devil, stay away from sin. You need to be good. <laughs> from Nishnabe perspective, you need to find the, the balance, right? We, we know that, that good exists. We know that not so good exists. But we need to find that balance within between. And that's the space in which we seek to achieve our, our, healthy, behave, our healthy existence. Okay, next slide. Okay, so Anishinaabe Mino Bomadsman, part three. And I'm going to bring these all together. So those of those who, uh, you know, uh, would speak the older dialect and language, well, it's not even that old, it's like maybe 20, 30 years. Um, and I remember hearing this, uh, instead of saying Anishna, which is Anish is like, you know, how, and na is eh? Oh, eh, is uh, what we go around saying now. But back then it was Anisha Jamadzin, Anisha Bomadzin. Like, how are you doing holistically? And that word Bomadzin is in that, is in that. And when I said that earlier, when I said, um, uh, Bamadzijit, you know, that's plural, you know, the, the, the living beings who are out there, you know, I greeted you when, when I said that. And there are others who have can say more to that. And I, I'm only a novice at understanding these kinds of things. But I remember hearing that. And, and that's where that idea comes from is we're, we're, we're expressing, you know, Bamadzwin or Bamadzwin when we say that, when we say, Anisha Shamadzian, like, how are you doing now today? And as, uh, you know, Nishnal Beck, and we still do this, we probably tell you a little, more, a little bit more things than we should have. You know, we start getting into details of things. Well, you know, things aren't being so great. You know, we just can't say, yeah, everything's great. You know, we, we'll say, well, things are not great. You know, and this is why, you know, and, or maybe things are, 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 are good. So um, I also, you know, I, I went on this little, little journey of trying to understand what health and healing was. And so I would speak to, um, you know, fluent speakers, you know, mostly my family, 
Um, and so, you know, I asked, you know, what's our word for health? And they said, well, we have no word for that. And, you know, I said, well, what's other words that we could use? And, you know, one of those words is in, in Ogdenween, you know, taking care of your mind um, and not seeing uh, who and how you live. Uh, you know, those are ways. Uh, but also I've, I've heard, uh, you know, Odzawin, you know, Odzawin is something that we, we use now. Um, and there's better ways of explaining all of these. This is my um, elementary understanding of it as it re expresses your culture, your worldview, your identity, and your spirit. And now we're trying to embed Odzuman in a lot of education, Indigenous education, and there's a lot of important work that, that is happening here. But as you can see here, when you're going through all of this, there's no really clear translation, right? They're talking about a process, a process that is continuously unfolding for, for each of us. And when we say be, you know, I'm not an expert in our language, but this is what we're, we're talking about, right? That, that, that process. And so when we say the closest word that we use now is minobamadzuin, you know, Minoa is good, um, be, and you know, Amadze, Odzwin, you know, this, that Odzwin is in there. That's the root word that's in there. And so this is the closest word that we can come to. And some of the work uh, research that I, I've done, and you know, uh, just very briefly about that, um, I did a, you know, uh, a research project on traditional healing on Manitoulin Island. And I didn't ask them exactly what traditional healing was all about, but I took from them what they were essentially saying. And what they were saying is that it's a body, spirit, earth connection. That, that's what, how they understand it. And they were using other words to express that. And in more recent work that we're doing, uh, we're, we're you know, coming back to my uh, cultural approaches to opioid addiction and, re and recovery. Um, we, we did an evaluation, uh, you know, a cultural evaluation essentially of this um, opioid um, uh, treatment program in Wequemco and Mantulan Island called Nandwe Mikan, the, the healing path or the helping path. And what we did is we, we went through, well, I did, and, and others too, we, we went through the, the, the cultural experiences that the community members would go through who were in the program. They would spend time on the land. They would listen from, to, to, they would you know, uh, receive teachings from elders in situ, in those land-based places. They would, they would uh, do medicine picking. They would, they would go fishing. They would go hunting. And they would, they would do those kinds of things. And what I found to be most effective is that, that bonding part. These were a lot of individuals who, through no fault of their own, come from broken families. And it's, it's not their, their fault that that's the case. And so they're seeking those answers. They're seeking that level of healing, which is, goes beyond the pharmacological understanding, biomedical understanding of what they were needing. They needed that the fire for their spirit. And so I was observing that as it was happening. I was going out on the land and going hunting with them and spending all the time with them. And what we came out, and these are just some of them, that, you know, land is important for Minobamadzwin as, as health. Teachings is important. Community is important. All of the activities were open to the community. They were not isolated in a, like a clinical uh, treatment model. Everyone was involved to participate. Family was involved. Children came out. Children were learning how to, to clean fish for the first time, those sorts of things. The person is important. Healers are important. Elders are important. And most importantly, sovereignty is important. Because in this particular community, they didn't have their own opioid treatment program. They had to go off reserve. And there was a lot of problems they were facing with that, with that arrangement. And they demanded that they have their own treatment clinic in the community. And they further demanded with, to the medical doctors and to the pharmacists is that you're going to help us and you're going to contribute. And if you're not going to do so, there's a long line of other doctors and pharmacists who want to do this kind of work because there's a lot of money to be made. And so the doctors and the pharmacists contributed and supported that model. And, you know, that's, it's complicated, you know, it has its up and downs, but the, the point here being is that they demanded sovereignty over their own health and healing. And they demanded that Anishinaabe Odsuwin Minobamadsuwin be part of that a process. And it's still unfolding, it's still growing. And so we're still doing work there. Uh, COVID uh, took us away from that. So we're hoping to get back. So in my time, you know, I, I would say that, you know, good health means identity, language, elders, teachings, social relations, medicines, ceremony, and I honor religion because not all of us follow our, our, our ceremonies. We might follow, um, uh, you know, a Christian religion, land, water, spirit beings, animal beings, dot, dot, dot. You can go on and, and we can spend all day talking or many days talking about that in the past, in the present, and the future. So it's this continuity of understanding. So next slide here. So I'm just going to speed up a little bit here because I don't want to take up all of our time here. So this is a, 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 a Medewan teaching, and you probably read about this in an ethnographic account. Uh, this is a uh, is in uh, Minnesota, 
speaking to Francis Densmore, who was an amateur anthropologist at the time, referred to as an ethnologist. And this teaching was given to Densmore by Mangas. And Densmore wanted to know, well, what is health? What is healthy living, health, health and well-being? And what, the, what Mangas had said is that, you know, we, we follow this path of life. And in this path of life, we're faced with temptations from being a youth to, to our elder age. And, you know, in life, we overcome these challenges to lead a respectful and spiritual life. That is what health means. And this image was, was drawn from that. And each of those uh, turns means that, you know, that's a challenge in our life and we need to overcome that. And so that's where that's coming from there. So I'll move on to the next slide. So I, I center Anishinaabemwin in, in the work that I do, even though I'm not fluent in it, but I know enough about it to recognize the importance of it and it's in, for, for the future generations and the present. And so I, I consider Anishinaabemwin and, and all Indigenous languages being an archive. It's an archive of understanding of a moment in the past when that world would have been activated, when individuals would have looked at the world around them and exercised those, those, those sounds to, to, to engage with that. And so I, I look at old dictionaries and the work that I do, I speak to elders and I just try to understand things. Um, I've got a long way to go, but I'm, I'm you know, making my way there. So in Baraga, Baraga was a, a Slovenian missionary working in northern Michigan with a lot of the people from Manitoulin Island, the, the ancestors, because there's a continuity there if you look on the map. Anyways, um, the word that comes closest in his dictionary to mean health is the good life good health, good kind temperament, good humor. So, you know, this is what was at the time of a, about the, the, you know, the Roberts and Huron treaties um, and all that time, just before that moment when we, we lost control of the territories and we, we went to the reserves. Uh, Hollowell uh, was an anthropologist who did work in, um, in Manitoba, uh, Minnesota, I mean, Manitoba and Wisconsin, Ontario. And he recorded that health means life. It means health, it means longevity. It means uh, well-being at the self family. And this is the goal of living. The goal of living is achieving um, these elements of being. So it's not only one thing where it's not a reductionist, uh, you know, biological process. There's all kinds of aspects to this. And uh, in a lot of Hollowell's writing, he, he rep re represents spirit in that and talks about that. Um, uh, James Dumont, Jim Dumont uh, wrote about this. Um, in, in this comes from a course he, he did, and, and it's not um, it's not um, that accessible. Uh, it was a course that I taught that I inherited, um, the cultural identity behavior of the native person. And in that course that he wrote, um, in the, the correspondence version, he writes about Bamadin Mikana and Nadzuin, and Nadzin, you know, the path of life. And, you know, biz moving, uh, um, Mikana and, and life, uh, Bamadin is a life, and Mikana is, is that path and, and road, and Nadzin is, is part of that life. Seven stages, you, you, Come across this before you know we go through this good fast wandering truth planning doing and elder stage and you know you, you've learned about that before or you will learn about that before if you have it and so there's a little bit of complexity in this path of life as he as he talks about it and if you look at a modern or more contemporary um national Benwin dictionary uh, by um by maria nakugija corbier who was at the nato studies department and has now retired and ran valentine a linguist um, they, they write about this, um, the closest thing that they write about here is to live a certain way, to have a certain way of life, be of such character, conduct to oneself in such a way, right? So that's a modern um, uh, discussion, definition of what that is. Menage um, the Madze is, uh, is, you know, to be in core health. So that's, you know, the, the you, you add that prefix to it, then you just change the whole thing, just like you add mina know to it, it, it just changes that. So I just want to say that there is that understanding of a, being in poor state of health, which is the, the opposite of what I've just described here in terms of good health. So next slide here. So I'm coming here to, to um, you know, close to my allotted 45 minutes here. So, uh, you know, just arriving here after the discussion. So as I pointed out here, and as we come to know, the determinants of health of, of us is deficit-based. You know, we're going to die earlier. You know, we don't have as much money, you know, we don't have as much services, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's our story, I suppose, right? That's been imposed on us. Um, and so, you know, we need to shift that gaze. And the work that I do, I, I struggle with this in, in the academy because, you know, I'm, I'm always being pulled into that. No, you can't forget about colonialism. You can't forget about all of these things. 
But I'm like, but I want to start focusing on other things. And they're the peer reviewers. So I have to say yes, because otherwise it's not going to be published. But anyway, so I'm shifting to a strengths-based approach. This indigenous voice, you know, the Thunderbird Partnership Foundation, the voices of elders, the voices of healers. They offer that strengths-based direction as to where we need to go. They're talking about balance. They're recognizing that, well, there is deficits out there, yeah. There's also, you know, ideal outcomes, yes. And, and so we, we strive for that balance. And so that's usually the, the, the meaning of the story as they say it. So what's important for me to say in what I've stated here, as you come to know, is that colonialism is at the center of that circle that I showed in that worldview. It's everything. It, 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 pushes against, it pushes against everything, all elements of our holistic being on a constant basis. It never stops. It never goes to bed. It never goes to rest. Maybe when we go to sleep, we take a little break from it, uh, but then it comes back. So as I understand it, then, when we apply Mino Bomadzuin to our current existence, colonialism is are those modern temptations in that path of light. And what it is, is it's contributing to those early, th th those early exits from our path of life that we did not want to take, the, the youth. I read in the newspaper and the obituaries and hear the stories of the young ones who are cons consistently you know, passing away. So that's a, a reality. We, we cannot forget that reality. And as I understand it and, and focus on this, um, and, you know, I engage, I've engaged with this idea of the shape-shifting nature of settler colonialism. So, you know, as we know, settler colonialism is all about eliminating the, the native, as, as uh, Patrick Wolf has written, and it's, all, it's an all-encompassing process. And the work of Ray and Corrado talk about how it exists in health studies. You know, we generate this image and control this image of the indigenous as being of ill health. And we control that narrative. We control that narrative to its outcome, which is the elimination of us. And there's always that shape-shifting nature of things that it may change in form, but never changes in substance. We're told the TRC, we're told the calls to action, which is the shape, but it's never the form that is the result. We talk about UNDRIP. You know, those are the shape-shifting natures of colonialism as they exist in these academic spaces and these government space, spaces today. And if you talk to the older ones who are still with us, they'll say, oh, yeah, that happened in the 60s and the 70s. They were, you know, Pierre Trudeau was talking about this and all of these kinds of things. So it's this consistent, perpetual relationship that we're faced with. And this is where I was coming from when I talked about the impact of that Robinson-Huron Treaty uh, being close to this shape-shifting consumption that was taking place. Um, however, you know, we, we seek to find that balance through Minobomadzwin as a continuity into this contemporary 21st century. And we do so by the expression of the First Nations determinants of health. We've always known what these are. That's what I'm basically trying to say here. Um, and, you know, now we have the attention that we have. Um, and what's central to that is the indigeneity, the indigenous experience in that, which is necessarily different because of the impact of settler colonialism that impacts us all, or we are all part of that narrative of, of our existence. And so within the indigenous context, our determinants of health it exists outside of that health model. If you come back to those two circles, you know, we're outside of that dominant circle, but we're connected because we have no choice to be. So that's one of the things that I hope what you will leave here today with. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I'm coming back to my stories here. Okay, so this is um, this story, I'm um, this story, well, this picture I, I, is, is fitting. Uh, so this picture is taken from my boat as I am traveling to Killarney from my home on the Fraser Bay. And if you follow the water and if you're in that area, you will know that Fraser Bay is almost always very windy. The West winds, you know, Nana Bojo's father is always expressing his existence by pushing those waves. And some days I can't be out there. Uh, this one day I was traveling and it was just like a, a clean sheet of ice. And as I, this picture was taken in, in motion and I just pulled out my camera and I just started clicking my, my phone. And um, I like this picture because um, uh, 
And so, you know, White Cloud is my uh, Anishinaabe name. And I was told that anytime you see that, you always remember your connection to where you are and your existence in this, in this world. Uh, and so I, I, I take this because this is, you know, uh, thinking uh, ahead to the future. And before I say what I'm going to say there, I'm going to come back to the to those stories. And so coming back to Nietzsche Ba, so I, I was always in awe of the resilience, determination, and confidence of my friend, who, who is no longer here, in his pursuit of Indigenous knowledge. He didn't have a whole load of money. He just had enough money to get to where he was going. You know, he didn't present himself as anything more than anyone else. And he knew what he needed to do. So he would go to a ceremony because he needed to be there. He would spend time with uh, elders because he needed to know that knowledge. And he, that was his university. He would go there. But he was also here at the time. His, his, um, his partner was a student here at Trent University. And he would come in to the lecture sometimes and just sit in those chairs like you. And he would say, you know, I need to learn this too. And so he understood what two-wide scene was when we didn't know what two-wide scene was, but we actually didn't know what it was, and but we just didn't talk about it. And so I, I have always honored him. And the work that we did is we were going into the school in, in, in Rama Majikining to, to talk about culture. And we would bring in a lot of what I talked about here, those good teachings, into that space. And what one of the teachers had said to us is, you know, the students really enjoy, they look forward to when you're here. Because, and I've, I'll, I'll, I've also observed them, that when you're here, they're calm, they're listening, they're learning. And so we would do a lot of hands-on, we'd do a lot of teachings, take them out on the land, all those really neat things. I didn't realize that at the time, but we were actually doing, you know, practicing Minoba Madsuin. And one of the things that Nietzsche would always say to me is that, he says, you know, pay attention to not, you know, don't pay attention to a person that's holding that feather, who's conducting that ceremony, but pay attention to how they conduct their life and how they treat other people said um, <clears throat> that is uh, that is what you need to focus on sorry he's no longer here so that's why I just had that little, little moment here so so that was that story there and so what he was talking about is is that he was talking about Minoba Matsuin and he didn't have really that formal education or you know he didn't read the ethnogra ethnog ethnographies like I was doing and all those kinds of things but he was actually teaching so I was his 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 you know apprentice I guess I suppose and Maybe we didn't know that, or maybe we did, but it was just how it was. And so I, I just want to honor him through those stories, and that's how I first came to Trent. I wouldn't have come here un unless he had told me ab about that. So uh, the other story. So the other story, you know, uh, I, I deal with a lot of folks who, who uh, you know, are informed by a scientific view of the world. Let's put it that way. And they would say, well, you know, you look at the, that weather forecast, it did say there was calling for, you know, rain. And, you know, it, it, it did say that, you know, sometimes rain happens, right? And sometimes it can happen really loud and all of those kinds of things. You know, that's one way of seeing. And coming back to that two-eyed way of seeing, you know, then you'll learn more about that tomorrow. Um, and, and you've already have. And so, you know, you, you learn, you know, that's one way of seeing it. And we're always confronted with that, that dominant Canadian worldview that, well, what you're saying doesn't really make sense in that worldview, so we're going to try as best as we can to, to set it aside, to minimize that experience. Um, but in my experience being out on the land and the fragility of our existence as it exists in the natural world that we don't really quite understand, I recognize that that is a true story that happened, that the, 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 the power beings were, were being called upon at that moment in time. And, you know, they were expressing themselves at that moment in time. And when I travel on, on my boat with my family over these rough waters, I know the power of nature. I know that if I go at the wrong time of the day, that, you know, it could be, tech, it could be you know, a uh, uh, danger. There, there's danger in that existence. And so that's what this reminds me of. But it also reminds me of this picture coming to my conclusion now that um, you know, there's, there, 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 is, there is hope in the, you know, just hope, meaning, purpose, and belonging with the Th Thunderbird Foundation tells us. And that there are those days when we, we recognize that connection. And th those are the days that uh, we, we seek um, the inspiration for Minoba Modswin. So I hope I've been able to, uh, to, to be that spark for your fire, but maybe you're already burning and I just threw in a piece of kindling and let it, blow up there for a little bit, or maybe I've just added a, another, another uh, uh, you know, log to the fire, but maybe I, I hope I've, 
I've uh, added some thought for you. So chamigwech babanchajik kinawayagi bashai for thank you for coming to, to listen to me and I'm here to hear the questions and participate in the dialogue and so chamigwech uh, iso ba. Shimigwech Daryl for that uh, really inspiring talk this morning. So we're going to have just a five minute intermission so you can maybe stretch your legs and go to the washroom just outside this door uh, and we'll come back for the panel. So um, try to make it quick if you can. Shimigwech. Appreciate it. Uh, appreciate yeah. your, your yeah. feedback, and I didn't know what to, what to talk about, so I kind of my mind was just flutter like this because you never you're never gonna have to worry about this. Right? Yeah. Go over a bit or no?
Okay, so just give them a warning then? Yeah. 
Okay, if we could just all take our seats again and we'll get the panel underway. Um, and all the panelists too to come back up. I appreciate that. Yeah, so we'll, uh, I'll, I'll maybe let all three of you that haven't spoken yet introduce yourself. So Jennifer and Sam. Um, and then I'll ask my one question and then we'll start with the red and then come back this way. And then, yeah, I think we'll stay sweet if you're okay with that. And we'll just kind of have a casual conversation like that. I think that would be okay. Um, but yeah, I'll let you speak. Okay. Okay, Ani Bojo, welcome back, everyone. Um, appreciate it. We'll have a few people coming in and out, I'm sure, but we'll. Uh, get underway with the panel as we're supposed to be out of this room by 12 as there's another event. So uh, we're a little bit under the deadlines today, but that's uh, typical for the elders gathering here. You'll be kind of flying to event to event to event. So um, uh, as kind of Dale spoke about, this is now gonna turn into kind of a, a casual panel with some of the panelists that we have up seated. Uh, you now know a little bit about Lorenzo, Daryl and myself. Uh, but the Anishinaabe Ninis have been dominating. So we're going to pass it over to some of the women uh, for them to introduce themselves and just kind of position themselves in the work that they do uh, in the local community. Uh, and then I have one question for the panel that I'll ask each one of the members to respond to. And then I'll open it up to the audience if anyone has questions you would like to ask to anyone specifically or just in general uh, to the panel. So that's how the next 45 minutes or an hour will roll out. So um, I'll pass it first to Lisa Fox to introduce herself. Ani Bojo, Kinagoya, Lisa Fox, and Dijnakas, Ogagaming, and Donjaba, Mishomas, Minawanos, Wikumukung, Gegabayang, Peterborough, Megwadada, Michisa, Gega, Nishnabe, Akieng. So, hi, everybody. My name is Lisa Fox. Um, I am, uh, grew up in Henvey and that First Nation, which is partway between Perry Sound and Sudbury. Uh, on my father's side, I come from uh, Wikimokong and Manitoulin Island, and on my mother's uh, side, I am uh, English and Scottish. Um, a little bit about my professional self. Uh, so I'm a Trent Fleming graduate from the BSCN program in 2006. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, it really feels great to have come full circle and be sitting back here talking on behalf of... Uh, you know, Trent and Fleming, and uh, so, yeah, anyway, so, um, uh, so I, uh, my, my background in terms of my experience, um, it clinically is emergency nursing, uh, as well as Indigenous health, so I've pretty much been to every single outpost uh, community in Ontario, First Nation community in Ontario, Manitoba, so I've done a lot of rural uh, travel, um, I've also traveled overseas and I lived in New Zealand for a couple years where uh, I got my master's in nursing at the University of Victoria in Wellington. Um, and then I uh, received an email from my cousin who said, hey, look, Fleming has this opportunity for a professor of practical nursing and they're specifically looking for somebody that can provide an indigenous perspective into the curriculum. Um, I know you're super happy in New Zealand, but why don't you come on back home? And so. I applied, I got the job, and I've been at Fleming College since 2018 um, with a, as a professor of practical nursing with an Indigenous perspective, and I'm also the clinical coordinator for the practical nursing program at Fleming. Hey, gosh. I need My spirit name is White Bear Woman. I'm, I belong to the fish clan, uh, the sturgeon, and I'm from <laughs> uh, Curve Lake First Nation. I have worked in health and social services probably around 35 years of my career life. Um, it's exhausting, <laughs> um, but I still love it. And I was intentional in my career to, to work for the indigenous uh, population, work for and with the, the indigenous population. So um, 
when I uh, started my career in, in Curve Lake, I, I started as economic development officer, uh, working in, in training and uh, career development and uh, business development. So my track of, of uh, schooling was in, in business mostly. But after leaving um, Curve Lake, I, I uh, came to Trent and worked as the admin assistant in the, the uh, Indigenous Studies Department. Um, and at that time, the Native Economic Development Program was in operation. So it was a nice uh, segue uh, to come here and, and work for the department. And then um, uh, I, uh, I got involved in, in First Nation politics. So I was uh, in my lifetime too. I was uh, 16 years as a council member for Curve Lake. Um, and in recent years, seven years as being chief. But, uh, you know, when, when those things come into play, you're kind of in and out of the, the politics, but yet you influence the agenda for health. Um, I also worked 10 years in, in the city of Toronto um, with uh, Anishinaabe Health downtown the health center, and, and that was comprised of both traditional and uh, Western uh, healing and wellness. So that, that really opened my eyes in, in terms of uh, the urban population and, and how living conditions were um, back, in, back in those years. I moved from there to the Indigenous uh, Friendship Centers uh, on Front Street, which is you know basically the head office. And um, you know, got to know how how the life was and, and the struggles that and the challenges that uh, First Nations and and, and the uh, Indigenous population uh, come to have in, in the city life and city settings. Um, I I also involved myself in the Toronto City uh, Health, uh, being part of, of committees as well. So it it kind of. It, it came to reality that you know things there were things that needed be, to be done so that you know we are part of of, of those those plans and part of the the um, uh, ways in which we we heal ourselves. Um, so and then I I got tired of the city. City life is hard. Um, you know, being in the city ten years and being away from family was was difficult. And then, uh, what else have I done? I've worked in First Nations, um, you know, locally, Curve Lake, um, recently, Alderville First Nation, and I worked in Hiawatha as well. So um, I see things firsthand in terms of, you know, the, the social detriments and, and certainly the, the health detriments and all those things that uh, Daryl spoke to. Um, and. And I think the biggest challenge uh, that I've seen and, and realized is being part of the bigger plan. Um, it's, it's a little lacking um, where uh, agencies and, and those um, structures um, don't really form those relationships. And I'm the kind that'll break down doors or, or be loud if, if I have to and, and say, you know, say it how it is and how we have to be very much part of those things. We have to be part of those strategic planning exercises. I was also part of the uh, Board of Health locally here, the Peterborough Board of Health, and uh, I got good experience there, but I also had that voice, a voice for Curve Lake. And we had a, a memorandum of understanding um, so that we could have that, that member to the Board of Health. And so um, Hiawatha is there now and as, as part of the board. And uh, so it, it's, it was starting that, that uh, uh, collectivity. And when the calls to action came to, to the forefront, I, I raised it as, as a point on the board that we need an advisory committee. So I'm happy to hear that it's very functional and it's very, um, intentional, I guess, to address some of those needs that, that I speak to. Um, what else have I done? I was also part of the, the 
PRHC, the Peterborough Regional Health Center, on, on their board of directors. Um, it was it was difficult at the time, of course, you know, uh, very male oriented. Um, mind you, this this was a few years back, but uh, um, and at that time, I influenced the need to have cultural sensitivity, cultural awareness training for all of the hospital staff. So Curve Lake hosted a, a four day event and uh, the hospital allowed some of the, the staff, you know, broke up the staff and, and came out to Curve Lake to, to uh, immerse themselves and be part of that awareness. So, you know, it, and when I say, you know, I, I'm intentional and I'll have that voice when, when I need to put it there and say the things that have to be said. So that's, um, that's me, but I think we need more of that. We need more of the engagement. We need more of the relationship building. And we have to teach our young ones, the ones that'll be following us uh, behind us to, to make sure that influence is there for, for the future and sake of our, our children. Lisa, miigwech. I'm from Mishka Seman Azibing in Treaty Tree. I am um, a PhD student here. I'm a mom of three. I'm panicking because my mom is watching and I know she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> that is like the scariest part because I know I'll hear it later. Um, so I um, moved here from Edmonton. I have a master's degree in public health from the University of Alberta, an undergraduate degree in Native Studies, also from the University of Alberta. I um, have been taught a lot of my cultural teachings because I'm OG Cree. Um, from my late in-laws. So that is um, late Wayne and Darius Roan. Um, they help shape me as well as my parents. Um, my, so I, I grew up OG Cree, so that's important because I lived in Winnipeg as a little urban Michi kid um, forever. And then I got to be a little Bush Indian res kid when I come and visit my dad in Treaty 8. So um, a lot of my teachings from my Woodland Cree side come from my Gwikwam. Um, her name is Margaret Capo. I think that's important because, you know, anytime we're taught things, especially by women, I feel the need to make sure it's extra heard because traditionally, um, just because of colonialism, we tend to downplay the achievements or workings of other Kwe, and that's not right. Um, I know that my father-in-law would always say that he was nothing without my mother-in-law, and you know she's the one that we gave her a house, she made it a home. Gave her children, they made she made it a family. She's the one who led the way. So without that, I don't think we would be anywhere. Um, I have a very supportive partner, so I also like to acknowledge his uh, his hand in success um, because he has been holding it through my tears and through my classes and like, does this paper make sense? That's that's his contribution. He's always like, yes. So <laughs> he's getting a free PhD out of this because I'm also a PhD student here at Trent. I'm in my second year. I just finished my comps. Woo! Um, <laughs> um, I got into Indigenous health, thankfully, to my firstborn. Unfortunately, it was um, the best experience also wrapped with the worst experience because of the experience of um, what we get to deal with in the healthcare setting. Um, needless to say, it was plagued with anti-Indigenous racism and it was just not a good thing. So I did what 
um, my grandmother, Jane, um, and my mom and my bukum would all do. I got mad and then I was like, okay, I'm going to do something about this because something needs to be done. Nobody deserves to go through this anymore. And I got angry and I enrolled in school. Um, so that seems to be a running theme is I got angry and I'm doing something about it. <laughs> um, I, that anger has pushed me right through my master's program where I got to sit as the president of the Indigenous Graduate Students Association at the U of A. I was helping to be the student representative with the elders group at Mama Leo Tosterin with the School of Public Health and really just it's been a long time coming. <laughs> I've got so much more to go. I'm hoping to help by um, my research focus, which is uh, educational policy for healthcare providers about Indigenous health. Um, so, hi, hi, miigwech. <laughs> miigwech, Sam, if you could just pass the mic to Lorenzo, we'll start with the question that I get to ask, because I guess that's host privilege. I get to ask the first question. So, um, uh, it's kind of a multi-part question, so you can take any angle you'd like to answer that. But um, from your experiences, all four of you up here, uh, how do historical and contemporary policies in Peterborough impact the social determinants of health for local Indigenous communities? And specifically, what culturally relevant strategies can be implemented to address these impacts? Miigwech. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my experience with the health system here has been one that has taken away the idea or the concept that we're all healers ourselves. And now we can work to heal ourselves by the way we live, as was explained earlier today. And there's been many illnesses, um, that have plagued me, but once I realized again that we can help heal ourselves, I've become more healthy. And if I can share that thought here today, uh, some people may begin to work on themselves because we didn't have these people that are making the rules before. We didn't have doctors that were um, the only people who could practice medicine. So it's a total breakdown of our belief system and how our health works. And till I caught that, I was a foreigner in my own land because of the people in charge. Um, can you read the question again, please? Yes, for sure. Like Jeopardy? <laughs> yeah. Uh, from your experience, how do historical and contemporary policy make with how do your how do historical and contemporary policies in Peterborough impact the social determinants of health for local indigenous communities and what culturally relevant strategies can be implemented to address these impacts? Um I think it's already been explained uh, the influence that uh, the health system has had on our people. And uh, we had a, a daughter born to us 30 years ago who came in very precariously. And it's been one big fight now for 30 years to get her the proper care that she needs. And I mean fight. You don't just ask for something and they give it to you. You have to tell them how sick you you really are. And you can't convey that in words. Not very well anyway. And so I think this the system that we we've engaged in, been pressured on us, is um, still working against us. And in little ways there's some movement. And I like to see the futures of these women here that talk and what they bring. Miigwech. Miigwech. Do you want me to read it again, Sam? Oh, my God. 
I think I got it. Okay. I think I got it. So I think that um, both historical and contemporary policies for healthcare in Peterborough is impacted as immensely. I mean, it's something that's shared from Peterborough to Edmonton to Mustard Chief. But just like Dr. Maniswabi was saying, we're affected in every sort of like negative sense. We are winning the race that no one wants to win. Um, in Edmonton, I mean, in Alberta recently, there was a report that came out on CBC talking about how Indigenous people in Alberta actually live, have their life expectancy reduced more than any other Indigenous population in Canada. And I was like, well, why? Hole, like, what the heck is happening? What makes, what's, what's going on with us? And I think that's the problem. We don't have a hand in what's shaping our health. We are being included on surface levels and not being included on policy decisions. That's really, that's where we need to be. We need to be making sure that um, healthcare providers are educated about us, our cultures, our tradition, our values, from the moment that they enter university and then throughout their career as professional development, refreshing that sort of knowledge. Because it's, it's fascinating, even since I've been here, I've only, this is my second year, um, I've had so many interesting experiences and I thought that, you know, maybe it's just because I'm used to the, the racism back home, you know, the good old devil, you know, um, that because I'm not from here, I'm seeing things and experiencing things because my, my senses are heightened. It's like survival mode. So I go to the hospital and immediately with my, with my daughter, and my son, I have three. So <laughs> that's always fun. Um, daycare right um so we go and the first thing that the doctor said to us instead of why are you here what's the problem i see you have alberta health who's gonna pay for this and i was like excuse you um so things like that like unknowingly or knowingly even being asked by the pediatrician who saw my daughter oh so your kids have all the same dad and i was like um how does that even play into what we're talking about and it's conversations like that that highlight that when we are seeking care it's almost like that's when we need to be the most vigilant because we're in such a vulnerable position already and it's kind of reflective on the health system in general because we're not in enough spaces that we need to be. We're not being included in the deeper spaces. We're not being pulled into these places and say, hey, we need you to help write this because we don't know where we're going wrong. And always, always like the, the saying, nothing for us without us needs to be applied in every sense of the word here because this is us, like all of our health indicators, everything, we don't, we have more precarious housing. It's definitely harder to find a house because we're also dealing with racism from being brown, which means, holy man, that, that fight just got a little bit harder. Um, and it's just insane how much we are needed in all of these places. So by all means, all the students in here, like, Come, assum, <laughs> come and come and up like help us because there's so much spaces where we need to be. And you know, that's that's just what I think it is when it comes to policy making here. Thank you, Mr. Sam. I um I think I'm the elder here. Um, 
I remember the time when the federal government sent in public nurses into the reserve. And, you know, there was no formality necessarily, but I, what I remember of that is drinking that cough syrup. That was the cure-all. It was alcohol-based and it was very sugary. And that's what I remember. So it's no wonder we, we've, we're, we're carrying the, the diabetes bug and, you know, that, that addiction for alcohol-based medicines. And then there was also, I remember also that um, we'd line up to see a dentist that was sent. And I don't recall our parents signing any consent forms or anything for our children to be looked at, to have teeth pulled for that matter. So I, I remember that and, and that's where I, I go back to for not having the consent and, and not having that voice and not being able to resist whatever the treatment or, or the medicine might be. And they couldn't care less if we had our own medicines or didn't want to know. So when we talk about um, where we're at now, it, it, it's all the more reason that we need to um, empower our people, empower the individual who's seeking that help. And we need them, need them to know that they have a voice and ask the questions and respond to those, those negative comments that we're subjected to many times over. Um, so we need to call that, call to action, I guess is what it is, um, that we have a voice, we have that, that need to be heard and, and to be known as who we are. And we are very much part of the health system, notwithstanding that um, we're part of those, those expenses that they always talk about, the healthcare uh, costs. So it's important for us to have that voice it's important to, to be part of those uh, initiatives locally and to, to uh, remember those that we leave behind at our, our places of home. And um, uh, just to be reminded that, you know, sometimes the elders don't, don't speak the English language at best. So make sure they have an escort, make sure that they can have their uh, point translated and heard. And then, um, you know, swinging back to, to birth um, and, and new life, we need to have our ceremonies in the hospitals. We need to people to know why we're doing those things. Um, and I, I'm sitting here chilled because you're clapping. And I, I remember a time when my grandson was celebrating in his own in his own self that he wanted to take his pipe and and go outside and uh, celebrate and, and ceremony for he, him and his family um, only to be stopped by the parking attendant to say you can't have fire here you can't burn your fire that was really emotional for my grandson and um, I said then never mind we'll do it when you come home but that's the insensitivity, and that's the, um, the, the very need that we have to have for people to understand us. And um, doing it once isn't enough because there's such a turnover in staff at, at some of these um, wellness facilities. We need to keep doing it over and over and over again because our stories change, and, and people who who represent us just like today, they change. So we, but we need to keep telling the story. So if I can end with that, Miigwech. Uh, I just wanna thank everybody for speaking before me because I was feeling a bit nervous on how to answer this question. <laughs> so Miigwech for that. Um, and and just uh, listening to to you all speak as well, uh, you know, so your your truths also ring, you know, within myself. So, um, I uh, because I've lived overseas in New Zealand, because I've lived here, 
Um, I've experienced the healthcare system in, in two different countries. I've also experienced the educational system in, in two different countries. And my, my experience of the two, it, it, they were very different. Um, I, so to go on a little story of myself, <laughs> a little bit deeper. So um, part of my uh, time here at Trent in my undergraduate, uh, as a nurse, you have a whole semester in which you're doing a consolidation placement. So you have to go and live and breathe and be a nurse and you're paired with a preceptor. And so one of the reasons why I chose Trent was because when we went around and visited dis different universities and we listened to people talk, I was told that I could do my consolidation anywhere in the world. And I just ran with that clearly. Uh, so I ended up doing my consolidation placement in New Zealand. And that's where I, I found my passion for New Zealand. But I, I really enjoyed that experience because New Zealand has a very much more inclusive environment for their indigenous peoples. The Maori word, the Maori language, the Maori culture is interwoven within everything that they do. It's in their education system, it's in their healthcare system, um, it's in their model of health and well and well being, and they apply that model to everybody. Um, on the other side here, so I do that. Uh, I do my consolidation placement. Um, I was offered a job, but I um, I didn't take it because my mom would have killed me at that point if I didn't come back. Um, <laughs> and I just also, uh, as we're acknowledging people that bring us to where we are today, I just want to acknowledge my mom who's in the crowd just over there. Wave, Debbie. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, so I came back, I, I did my emergency nurse thing, I did my rural and remote nurse thing, uh, but I kind of got a call to go back and I, I did outpost nursing, rural and remote outpost. When it started to get cold, I went to New Zealand because they have opposites, summer, summer. So I did a perpetual summer for about three years and then I decided to stay there. Um, when I did finally come back and I lived in New Zealand for about six and a half, years almost um, when I did decide to finally come back I wanted to come back and the intention was to reconnect with my family more I had a young daughter that I wanted her to know where she was from um, I wanted to reconnect with my culture I wanted to reconnect with my community um, but when I came back I, I I had a culture shock I I came back and I was like why is everything so siloed I didn't understand it and I totally I, like I forgot because I was living somewhere completely different. And um, that was that was a that was a struggle for me. Um, then I, that was a thing that I needed. I realized that actually it I needed to come back. I needed to come back to this place. I needed to come back to Fleming. I needed to come back to Trent to have an impact. And um, one of the things that I often, think about is you know the way in which we structure our models um you know the model of healthcare, the model of education that's from a very limited viewpoint right um whereas and what we try to do is we take this model and then we try to jam pieces into it to make it fit to make it for indigenous people or is what you know they they say that they're doing However, if you're starting with a model that is fundamentally narrow-minded and from a very specific viewpoint, you're never going to get the care to get the education that you need, that is, that is needed for the people, that is needed for the community, that's needed for you know, the individual. Um, and so if you flip that model on its head and you start foundationally with a model you know, and, and uh, Dr. Manitowabi had put a couple up there. So there are a whole bunch of different models that exist that if you started with something that's foundationally from an indigenous lens, that's foundationally uh, acknowledges that there is more than one way to view the world, 
an indigenous lens means that you acknowledge that there's more than one view of the world. There are many views of the world, and in fact, they all have value, they all exist at the same time, and they can exist at the same time. That's not the current model that we live in. But if you took a model that foundationally has that at its core, at its, at its heart, and then added the Western pieces into it, because they do have value, you're going to create something that looks vastly different, but it's also going to fundamentally include indigenous culture. It's also going to fundamentally include a more wraparound service of culture and healers and whatever that person needs in that moment, whatever that family needs or whatever that community needs. And the other piece that I that I think about as well is, um, you know, we talk about acknowledging where we come from and talk about, you know, where our knowledges come from. We have teachings. We should be looking to those teachings. Our teachings tell us how to interact with the world. They tell us how to move through the world and interact with the people and the land and one another in a respectful way. They talk about collaboration. And so when we're looking at strategies to, to help address this, I think, you know, collaboration, including you no, know, you know, no decision without us. No decision. How's it go again? That's it. Yeah. <laughs> no decision about us without us. Um, you know, the it's it's part of our teachings. We already know this. Like the um at the beginning, uh who who was the gentleman? Thomas, yeah. Uh Thomas had mentioned. Um, and I'm now very aware that he's going to be watching this, but Thomas had mentioned how, how, you know, we're being told there's not enough research. We need more research to do the thing. We know that there's a problem. Why do we need, continually need to do more research on people to spend more money to fix the problem? Um, when I was kind of preparing, and I'm, I'm a note taker, so when I was preparing for today, I, I got myself kind of stuck in a, a chicken and an egg situation. I couldn't figure out where my thought should start. I couldn't figure out where I sh should start my action. And that kind of reminded me of, you know, of a cycle, you know, like of a trauma cycle that you're in. It kind of self, it's self-perpetuating. It keeps going and going if you don't do something about it. And that's, that, that's what's happening here. There's no one good place no there's no one specific that's the best place to go into it to break that cycle to break that that circle you just have to go and do it so about i think for me it's about i love talking about things but also let's make an action towards it as well I, I just want to acknowledge the experiences that, that were shared here. And I, what I can just add is more of the same. Um, and the approach that I've taken is just to bring those stories into the educational spaces, uh, because there's a, just coming back to the, the ignorance that is um, displayed to our experiences. It's, um, it's shocking because the consciousness of those words is so blatantly racist and discriminatory, but it's not acknowledged. It's like, you know, I didn't mean to say that, or, or I don't know why you're so upset about what I just said. So those are experiences that, that we've all faced. And um, I, I could say more, but I want to hear what others here at the panel have to say about uh, the, the questions. There are going to be more questions so I'll, or from the audience, so, so make much. Any questions from the audience? We only have about 10 or 15 minutes. I'll do first Michelle and then Cheyenne at the back, please. I'll be quick. Um, I'm Michelle and I retired from Trent two years ago and I want to thank the panel and I want to thank Professor Manitowabi and also the testimonials that you've all given. Um, thinking of balance and that when to go and hope. Um, this is in a way, me speaking as an academic, but I'm thinking of a recent PhD graduate at Trent, Amy Shawanda, who's from Wickham Cone. And um, David and I co-supervised her uh, PhD dissertation on Anishinaabe maternal teachings. And she interviewed people from her community. And when she came to me, I said, sure, 
I'll work with you on this. Um, but you need to have, if she's willing, Edna Manitowabi on your committee. So it was a, a shared committee between David, who does have some uh, components of indigenous determinants of health, and Edna, who gave her some of those uh, maternal teachings, and myself as kind of the, the all-around troubleshooter, saying, OK, this is shorten this version and expand that version of the thesis. But she's now in the faculty of medicine at McGill. And, you know, she's experienced firsthand uh, some of what you're talking about. When she came to Trent to begin her PhD, she was pregnant uh, with, with a baby who was born halfway through uh, the research, the course on indigenous research methodologies. And, you know, she had done her MA at, at uh, Laurentian on the need for people to be able to smudge in hospitals, and that was a huge battle, right? So just just things like that. So she's now um, working in the area of public health, but also IK, and young medical students at McGill are learning why it's important to honor women and um, maternal teachings about infancy and childhood, but also seven generations before and seven generations in the future. So I just want to, I guess it's an advertisement for Trent. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, <laughs> we need to renew um, the kind of research that we do here, but I worry as well that with the current political situation, things might be going retrograde, you know, and so we need to be vigilant and we need PhD students like yourself to take up this sort of thing that's been begun already. So, Miigwech, and uh, if there's a question, it's, well, given that we need to live with hospitals, how do we manage this moving forward? Anyone can answer that one, I think. I will always go for the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can you repeat your question, please? We move forward by uh, continuing what we've been doing and increasing the level to which we're doing it. Um, people like yourself have have put more people out of this place than, than yourself. So we are increasing our numbers. I don't know how many fold every year. And our population is going up when other populations are going down. But we mustn't forget that our aunties and our grannies, they know tricks of medicine that we don't have to take the pills that are provided by the other system. And we don't have to take their guidelines that you have to have a certain amount of education to heal someone. That is not the truth. Miigwech. You want me to have a crack at it? <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Some days as a PhD student, and I know my cohort in here, and the cohorts that came after us is always like we're we're tight because it's a shared experience. <laughs> um, I don't think I think we're so it's okay. Sorry, I'll gather. Um, I think it's such an interesting experience because across the board. It's so incredibly different. Um, I noticed here at PRHC, they don't have an Indigenous health program or an Indigenous health like gathering space, which is something that we have in Edmonton. Um, not to say that it's perfect. There, there is problems. So there's still lots of work everywhere. But I mean, we're all in different places. And I think that we need to be um, collectivizing a little bit better, reaching out across the board. Because if we're going to say all our relations, well, we're all here together. We all experience this together. We know what needs to be fixing, but we now need to come together and like 
how big a problem that is and make it more standard. Because I know that that's something I'd love to see here at JAC is, is elders on staff, elders helping with the healing process, elders being consulted and maybe some of the IK that we know, um, that'll be like the next debate. How much of our knowledge do we put into the medical system? That's what I'm hoping for. So that way we can start closing those gaps because we know it needs to be closed. We know it needs to be done. We know that we're all in different stages of healing. We know that we all practice differently and that some of us, you know, have embraced religion instead of, um, you know, our cultural and that's cool, whatever works for everybody. But we know that regardless of that spirituality and that religion and the culture, we all experience the same thing because we're all brown and we all go into the system. It, it, uh, Non-Indigenous health care providers don't see us as Nehuas, um, Anishinaabeko. They don't see us as a, we're just, we're just neighbors. So we got to figure out how to work together to pull it so we're all getting to the same spot together. And I think that's going to be the hard part, but I'm hoping that the next fight is how much of our knowledge goes into the medical system. That's where I'm viewing the future at. <laughs> Thanks for your question and, and miigwech uh, Edna for the work you've been doing as well. Everybody uh, needs to have that, uh, that sense of needing to help. Um, I'm on a, an indigenous advisory committee um, with Lake Ridge Health, which is the cancer hospital in Oshawa. So we're developing our own curriculum to deliver and we're just gonna launch it in, in March. Um, Hopefully, uh, it'll address some of the things that we're talking about today and more, and and hopefully um, assisting those ones who are encountering problems and issues at, at the eMERGE departments or or in the in their journey of care, um, that they have a way of, of of complaint. I even hate the word complaint, but at least bringing forward their their matter and their their. Um, concern and that way we'll we'll be able to address it it from from the hospital at viewpoint and what we've done in as part of um uh, to preface the uh the training we invited the senior officials out to a gathering in, in alderville and we we gave them some of our teachings and and some of the trainings that we've had for for health and well-being so it it's a start and I think if we can um, uh, take part in that kind of movement and, and get it to other hospitals where our, our indigenous populations uh, come to those, those care settings, then we will accomplish a lot. So if that, that can be an example, um, I'll share that with you. Hey, Dutch. Um. I, I too, like uh, the both of you, uh, would would echo words of of education, um, examining the curriculum for nurses, examining the curriculum for doctors, examining the curriculum for our uh, you know social workers. Uh, again, the the lens and the viewpoint is is very specific. It's created from a very specific viewpoint, um, making sure that um, the curriculum reflects the population that it's serving. Um, and, you know, I think that's an important part. The other part about the education is, you know, why are we waiting so long to teach people? You know, our, our teachings themselves is, is to teach the children. Why can't we be starting this? They have to learn, they, they start in kindergarten all the way up to before they get anywhere. You know, I know that changing an entire curriculum for the province is challenging, but what about KPR? Can KPR say, I know that not, not in the entire province is gonna do this, but this is what we're gonna do when they make a commitment and that serves local community, that, ser that serves you know, our local population. Um, so, I, and, and in that way, you know, you're, you're, breaking part, you're breaking into that cycle, right? You're breaking into that circle the same way that you know, we've had this intergenerational trauma. 
take the fam take the children away from the families because that's going to create this horrible cycle that then is going to you know create a genocide of an entire population let's again flip it on its head let's use that let's break into that cycle let's educate our children at a very young age let's put it into the formal education system um, and so that our children learn cultural humility so they become culturally safe in everything that they do therefore when they get to a curriculum then they're looking at a textbook and they're like well that's racist they can call it out they can feel confident calling or emailing or whatever to the publisher talking to their professors about it it, it creates that confidence in themselves and, and then is ultimately going to lead to a generation that is going to make those changes. So looking at what we can do in the, in the curriculum now, but also looking at you know our seven generations moving forward. Yeah. We're technically over time right now. Okay, I'll just, <laughs> I'll, I'll just go really quickly. So sure. I, I would say that, uh, well, first of all, we need to recognize indigenous knowledge and wisdom as a competency. And we need to hire more Indigenous peoples with those competencies and, and positions of authority. So that's the first step. And so one of the things that I do um, is I try to, gen I'm generating a hidden Indigenous curriculum at the medical school. I inv invite elders to speak. I invite healers to speak. And the presence of us is, you know, is maybe having some impact. I'm not sure. But we can also take, um, take um, lead from the past. And so like on Manitoulin, for instance, uh, Dr. Jack Bailey, who was a medical doctor, collaborated with uh, Ron Wakihijikba, who was a healer, and they, they did research together, and they applied for research grants, and they also started up the Mekpatoxigic uh, um, Council, which was an Indigenous council to inform how hospitals can have better relationships with the Indigenous community on, on Manitoulin Island. So I would say to, to encourage the hiring of people with Indigenous knowledge and wisdom as a competency, uh, work with allies, and, and you know, work together to try to change the system and to keep on doing the work in terms of um, education and curriculum. So uh, unfortunately we're out of time and we're gonna have to wrap things up. There's another event coming in right after this, but I encourage you to have these conversations throughout the weekend and just another chi miigwech to all the panelists this morning for speaking and Daryl for the keynote. <laughs> And then uh, I would just also like to like thank some of the people in the background as well this morning, Mara Hyber, who was there working on the Zoom, uh, Don White, who was back there running the video, and Lee Bolton, who was helping shuffle people through, as well as Malora Lucas as well, who's been running around all morning. So chi miigwech to all those people. Uh, they helped make this possible. That's everything. Bama P, we hope to see you around uh, this weekend. Take care, everyone.